Hello. Welcome. Jeff Raspy from 90.5 The Night, Brookdale Public Radio here with my old friend, Reverend Moose. How are you, sir? How are you doing, Jeff? Great to see you. <laughs> Indeed. It has been a while since since we ran into each other, undoubtedly at a show. Um, That's very factual. I, 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 I couldn't tell you the number of times I've seen you that wasn't at a show in my life. Well, that's true. That 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 is kind of a the balance of at a show and not at a show is probably way out of whack. Um, (laughs) But that's because of what we do. Yes. And um, for anybody who doesn't know, Moose, uh, I've known for many years from his work at labels and independent promotion companies and uh, stuff like that. And in recent years, you're one of the founders of something called the Marauder Group. Um, who do promotion and artist yeah. development and stuff like that? I mean, our, our role is to basically simplify the North American market. And, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of marketing, promotion, um, strategy, building, and uh, a, a significant amount of just educational programs, if, if you will, business development programs. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, a few years ago, I guess you guys were also the ones behind Independent Venue Week. Well, we brought it to the U.S. Uh, we were the oh, ones really? that brought it to the uh, the first the first uh, country outside of its home territory of the U.K. And we brought it to the U.S. to coincide with the U.K.'s fifth anniversary. And uh, we were making pretty big plans for this year. Uh, that was our intent was to uh, grow and grow and grow. And this year was going to be a pretty big growth year. We were expecting to have twice as many venues and 10 times as many shows and, um, you know, make it bigger and better and had all the partners lined up and the venues on board. And uh, then, then, you know what, just everything kind of got put on pause. Right. Yeah. Which I think is, um like those of us who are trying to stay optimistic about it is that everything was put on pause yeah not necessarily stop right um well that's you know that um that that i think is the uh the probably the the smartest way to be able to look at it right because even in the early stages and so when when governments and um, festivals and uh, conferences started getting shut down in the very beginning of March. Uh, We, as Independent Venue Week, uh, took the opportunity to essentially create an online community, set up a call, which ended up being a weekly call, still is a weekly call, and uh, had people from all over the country that could essentially sit down and talk about what was happening and what they were going through, all from the independent venue and promoter community. And it was through those conversations that NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association, uh, came to fruition because we as independent venues and promoters didn't necessarily have a representative on Capitol Hill. So it was pretty easy to agree that something needed to be done and somebody needed to help us. And, you know, like you look around the room and and you're going, so who's going to do it? And so we we, we did it like we, we we collectively put together a committee and um, had the conversations and elected board and I, uh, you know, came back in a few days and said, listen, this is it. This is Neva. And um, I've been in, in addition to what I'm doing. Running and the organization to be stable organization post COVID-19. And that's obviously our goal is to be talking about post COVID-19 in a way that allows people to feel some sense of um, familiarity, if you will. And the reality of this situation is the venues were the first to close and they will be the last to open through, right, through which, this process. Which is funny. I was, I was going to bring that up in a little while that, 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 that is, you know, maybe a week or so away from becoming like a roll your eyes cliche of first to close last to open. But that is in fact what, I mean, there is truth to cliches. Sure. (laughs) So, and and that's exactly what happened. I mean, you know, like we, we, 
as an industry, we could watch it where you're sitting there and you're going, the show must go on, the show must go on. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, it was there will be no events over a thousand people, over 500 people, over 200 people. All bars must be closed. Like you could see this municipality to municipality yeah. and every single one was different. But it started with the live events and with the venues and, and then it worked its way down. And now as people are talking about reopening strategies and the process of it, even in uh, the inclusion of, of venues, they're not just in the fourth phase. They're in the last part of the fourth phase. And, uh, you know, the ability for some to be able to reopen uh, affects the entire country in the sense that even if we can have venues that are open in, in a few key markets, they're all interconnected for touring artists, for the national infrastructure. Um, it's a low profit margin to begin with. So being forced to cap your potential at uh, 25 or 50% from the onset is just not economically feasible. Yeah, and then you have all these added expenses in addition to that to try to make things appropriate. Yeah, I mean, everyone is, all businesses, especially all small businesses have yeah. been having a tough time with this. Um, and the the PPP, the payroll, um, whatever the other two pieces. Payroll protection plan, yeah. That's it. Um, I mean, that helps up to a point, but, you know, it, it's undoubtedly not enough and it's not going to last long enough. Um, it, it also didn't, it also didn't address the needs of this business model yeah. where payroll is not the heaviest, uh, cost, you know, the, the fixed cost, if you will, the rent and the insurance and mortgages and, you know, all of these other aspects, ticket refunds actually brought most businesses, most venues into the negative. Yeah. Um, as opposed to just a non-revenue generator, it was a, a loss every single month because of refunds. Um, so our our ask as Neva has been uh, pretty consistent to be able to modify PPP, which you know we're supporting Restart Act, which is um, you know uh, being pushed through now. Uh, we are asking for um, uh, you know essentially concessions that would accommodate the nuances of this business model and because the governments are the ones that have been uh, responsible for closing the venues, they should be res responsible for helping to keep them through this and to help them, uh, you know, reopen in a, in a safe manner. It would be great to have that type of uh, information, that type of financial support. And uh, without it, um, the landscape's going to change significantly. Yeah, I think that's one of the things, I mean, you mentioned a couple of things that I think a lot of the general public doesn't realize is that most of the independent venues were operating on such a slight margin yeah that without being open yes it costs money to book a band it costs money to have somebody work the door costs money for security cost a bartender all this other stuff but to literally not be open and not have anyone coming in and buying drinks or buying tickets there's zero and I'm sure very few of them, if any, are getting any sort of, uh, oh, you don't have to pay rent for the next three months. Or, oh, you know, don't worry about the insurance. Nobody's coming in, so why why pay insurance? Um, although I'm getting, you know, a discount from my auto insurance company yeah. who, who's aware that, you know, most people aren't driving. So, Yeah, but that uh, discount didn't come because your auto insurance company decided they were going to be nice. To <laughs> they're gonna be, the discount they're came be because people, it was... Yeah. Yeah, it was it was passed across the board. And so that's what we're asking for is we're asking for some some federal oversight that allows uh, the businesses to be able to operate. And they're very proud of, of being independent. And it's something that, uh, you know, at no other point in history, can you think about all the independent venues and promoters in the country coming together and asking for help? We are asking for help. Like well, that, that is. Yeah, that was, something, that was something that occurred to me. I was Well, first of all, when when I first caught wind of NEVA, which is, by the way, the National Independent Venue Association that Moose and a handful of other folks started, um, to, to do things like lobby Congress for making some of these changes, my first thought was, how did this not already exist? <laughs> well, I, and I, started I think there's an easy the, answer to that. I, I, I started thinking about the independent nature of these venues and they're like, you know, I'm going to do this. It's, um, you know, no matter what happens, I'm going to 
pull myself up by my bootstraps. And, you know, honestly, you'd have to be over well over a hundred years old to have, to have any memory or any sense of memory of something like this. Yeah. Uh, you know, 19 years was a long time ago. <laughs> there's, there's reasons though that it hasn't existed yet. And, 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 you know, it's difficult to be able to start something and do it correctly. Right. So if you're going to do something like this, everybody's going to have a whole lot of questions and um, you know, because independent venue week had already been operating and had its own guidelines uh what we did was essentially adopt um much of those guidelines as we as neva um helped uh you know solidify things creating committees and task forces and uh getting protocols into place and hierarchy in place and securing funding and all the other things that um if you had built this from scratch you and a couple colleagues would be sitting around a table and it would be a priority for tomorrow and then the next tomorrow and the next tomorrow. And uh, there's no perfect solution. But in, in this instance, uh, it's been such an, um, uh, an urgency that we didn't have the luxury to have those conversations. So it was, we know this needs to exist. It now exists. We're in motion. And everything else can kind of come behind that. That's, that's why it's... Um, uh, you're you're seeing people that would otherwise be competitors uh, that sometimes are neighbors and didn't necessarily yeah. have as uh, you know personal of a relationship. You're seeing the, these these people in their own markets or or, or you know uh, you know complementary markets coming together and being able to uh, to to help each other's businesses in a way that um you would expect if you're um if you broke your arm and your neighbor sees you trying to shovel your sidewalk right everyone's arm is broken no one yeah. has a shovel so we're all out there together right now and it's funny it, it reminds me a bit of uh the radio industry which i am still in and you had been in yeah where it's always cutthroat competition yeah until there's a threat to all of them yeah. and then it's like Oh, okay. Maybe we should play nice for a while. <laughs> but I think that's the nature of business to some degree, and and that's why the the system that we generally operate in is um, it feels like there's opportunities to be able to succeed if you just kind of you know keep your head down and work hard and put in the hours and um, you know to what extent that's actually true or not uh, could be debated. But at least the concept is there to be supportive of. Um, when there's no business to be had, then it becomes a matter of who has the most uh, capital to be able to get through to the end. And when yeah, we, and I was going to say, and and is that because one of the questions I had is what, um, where is the line in the sand between being an independent venue and a non-independent venue? Because by the way, if you go to saveourstages.com, you will see a list of it has to be well over two thousand venues now. Um, and it's funny. I remember when you guys launched and it was like 600 or so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and if you look Which, at the, by the way, 600 is pretty huge in itself. It's right? a lot. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you look at the list, you'll find, I mean, literally everything. I just, I just actually noted some from New Jersey, New York city and, um, Philadelphia just to give folks kind of an idea, because I think there's a misconception out there that, you know, depending on how large you are is is how you you're involved in this but there's literally places as small as you know the saint in asbury park and the chubby pickle in highlands which are both under 100 or under 200 capacity to yeah. the hammerstein ballroom in new york city which is 4000 5000 I mean, we have we have amphitheaters that are members, right? You know, open yeah. air amphitheaters. And uh, I think that when people talk about independent, it's important to understand that these are these are venues that are not owned or operated or booked uh, exclusively booked by uh, multinational or you know publicly traded companies. They're um, almost predominantly locally owned, uh, and uh, they're small and medium sized businesses. Uh, you know, even if you have a large property if you will. Uh, you also have to think about the different uh, uh, mechanisms of what goes into even staffing that. 
right? Mm-hmm. Is it a is it a year round staff? Is it a seasonal staff? Uh, are they are they full time hires? Are they are they um, you know contractors? Like all of these are things that people are, um, I guess, navigating, especially in today's terms where somebody might have had the support of a publicly traded company in the past for marketing reasons or whatnot, but when um, you know everybody's in the trenches uh, together, you realize who does and doesn't have your back. Mm. And um, you know the the economics for uh, for maintaining a business with negative income uh, are not necessarily that good. And we did a survey reasonably uh, soon after Neva started. And we basically asked people, how long can you sustain without financial support? And we had uh, 90% of our members said that they would not make it more than six months without financial support. Yeah, which I think is because, I mean, um, there are definitely because I've spoken to some of them. There are definitely people out there who feel like clubs and bars closed all the time. There's always going to be one that that opens up in its place. And actually I was one of those people who have said that yeah. you know, as I watched legendary places in New York city, like CBGB's and the bottom line and tramps close other venues opened up. I, I hesitate to say took their place because they don't have the history yet, nor do they have the address. Sure. But- <laughs> but that's, that's the free market and that's how it that yeah. works. But I think but what's this important is a different is- situation. This, this is, this is an, an extinction event, yeah. right? And it's an extinction event on multiple levels because it's not an extinction event of live music or live events, right? There will always be live music and live events. And it's, it's an extinction event of the businesses that are community-based, that work to support their communities, that run fundraisers, right. that people plan weddings at, that um, you know host graduation parties, that um, you know are 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 generating uh, local jobs and putting that money back in. For every one dollar that's spent on a ticket at, uh, at 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 an independent venue, it generates twelve dollars in local economy. Right? right. So that's which that's something I wanted to to bring up too to some of the naysayers, is that it isn't just X venue. Right. It's the businesses around it that if it goes away will be affected. Yeah. Um, and not in a good way. They'll be affected. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's you know, I think I think that there's um, a, a lot of misunderstanding of what the line is between, um, you know, entertainment and uh, and economics and, um, you know, the the economic structure around live events is massive, absolutely massive. And you're talking about, uh, you know, the impact that it does to the hotels and the restaurants and parking garages and airlines. And, uh, you know, even on a, on a smaller level, um, you know, the, um, uh, uh, e- equipment manufacturers, whether that's musical equipment or bar equipment or, y- you know, trucking equipment, like all of these things are intertwined. It, there are very few industries that are so interconnected in mm. this way. And there are so many different um, jobs that depend upon it because even even uh, the, the recording industry, you know, most most professional artists get the lion's share of their income from performing live. And uh, which means, in turn, the rest of the the food chain gets their yeah. lion's share of their income from having artists that are able to continue supporting careers. And without the independent venues, without those that are able to make decisions based on different uh, different um, needs than just the bottom line, right. then all of a sudden you lose your options that allow the different um, uh, flavors come through uh and that would be from new and developing talent Mm -hmm. to interesting tours that are being booked from other markets that are just kind of looking for something else to come through there's uh, um it it's it's the repercussions are not just a a fewer spaces to be able to see arts it's fewer options to be able to um experience the that same uh that, that that same need and um and though Though there will always be live events, 
I, I think we've seen what happens when you remove options from the marketplace. It's rarely good for the consumer. It's never good yeah. for the consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that was, that was one of the things like I, I tried to make that point online uh, last week or two weeks ago um, that, you know, we're not talking about a venue here and a venue there closing as your survey pointed out, nine out of 10 could disappear. And that basically obliterates any sort of touring um, circuit because you wouldn't all of a sudden you're touring the west of Canada where there's, you know, a show in one city and then you have to drive 1200 miles to get to the next one. <laughs> but think about it. Think about it this way. Let's say let's say, um, you know, these were shoe stores and nine out of 10 local shoe stores or, or shoe stores in your neighborhood disappeared. Shoe stores in your state were to disappear right? It doesn't mean that you no longer have options in, in going out and getting shoes. You, you, you can't try them on, you know, on, right. on the internet, right? So, but, but more than that, the few shoe stores that do exist don't have the capacity to be able to serve the market in the same way. Yeah. So they can't, they, they can't, I don't know, maybe it's a broken metaphor, but like, you know, <laughs> there's only so many stages you can put people on before you run out of stages. There's only so many tours that are going to route through. It, it, it constricts the creative process that leads to um, uh, uh, the, the communities that we have. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's a, a, a nice analogy of, of the, the, the possibility of, you know, and and it's not just you know, younger bands, unknown bands, um, stuff like that. Most bands from other parts of the world, and you kind of know this firsthand, most bands from other parts of the world come in. They're not going to start at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, <laughs> they're going to most, and most bands from other from, most bands from other parts of the world lose so much money on their tours. The states, yeah that for the most part, some of these people that are booking them on the first or second time through are doing it because they believe in the artist, period. And they're working with the artist and their manager and their team to be able to help create a foundation that allows the third or fourth or fifth tour to be um, at a break even. Right. Um, Not even profitable yet. <laughs> right. So, and, you know, that's that's an investment that these venues are doing on their behalf to be able to help create that ecosystem that allows uh, artists to be able to grow. So when people say that these are the places where superstars get their start, it is a literal meaning. Yeah. This, these are the places where superstars get their start because they're willing to open their doors when others are not necessarily as 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 viable options. As, yeah, as or as or as even as as open. They're, yeah. you know, I, I mean, I, I a lot of the places I frequent will go out of their way just because they like a particular artist. They know it's not going to make money. You know, they they try to pack the bill with yeah. you know local artists that might take care of the draw um stuff like that and then have them back over and over and over again until yeah. they build that audience in that market um and it's funny i think that uh in in um previous endeavors you you i am i remembering this correctly you've had um reason to be very in tune to new zealand yeah yeah, yeah. I, I helped uh i helped new zealand create their um their export strategy to north america uh some 12 years ago or something yeah. like that and yeah. i and it, it's hit the news recently that new zealand is the first nation on the planet to bring coronavirus and covid19 cases to zero yeah. That's that's that was also my doing. I can take credit for that too. <laughs> and and I think that's that that's a, a very significant thing because even right now, as people are going stir crazy and running to the store and running to the salon and running to the beach and nobody's wearing a mask anymore, um, which you know, guess what? We're gonna have it again. Um, New Zealand took a very stern stance against it all yeah. and now they've brought it to zero and th and that's kind of what i've been saying the last couple of weeks you know even as numbers are coming down and everybody's sort of you know throwing off the shackles i'm like okay th maybe they're coming down but they're not at zero so at what point like do in of the of the members of neva you know the venues and the promoters and whatnot at what point do you think they'll be comfortable 
reopening to um, a capacity worth opening for. Um, Cause I, th I remember reading recently that somebody had, um, somebody had figured out using the social distancing rules, how many people they could fit into their venue, which I think was somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 capacity. And the total was nine. Right. <laughs> Look, I, I think that it's, I think that it's important to understand that everyone is hungry to reopen, right? Everybody wants to be a part of the experience. They want their yeah. businesses operational. They want to earn income. Everybody wants that. So it's, uh, it's bizarre to be in a position where we have business owners that are saying they would prefer to not open because it doesn't make sense for other people's safety or economically for them. And, uh, and you know, it, it has that possibility of confusing people on the other side. But the truth of the matter is, is what business can open that is expected to take a loss for the indefinite future? You know, there's been, there, there's, there's talk about it, it could potentially be the middle or the end of 2021 until, you know, we're able to reopen at 100% capacity or a vaccine, which probably right. is coming around the same time, you know, so, so it's like these, these stop gaps are not resolutions. They're, they're, they, they allow people to feel good about what they're doing, but it doesn't necessarily bring any type of resolution to it. And the issue that we have is that there is no finite deadline. It's not right. going to be, you have to be closed for three months or six months or 12 months or whatever that case might be, because we don't know. So without that information, you have to make business decisions based upon how long you think you can last. And we already know that almost every single one of our venues is not going to last more than six months. So they're put in a position of without government support, uh, having to make whatever decision they can to do, get anything into the door. And that's not in the best interest of either their business or the local communities. You know, I'd love to I'd love to be able to see where. Even if even if it does make sense and, and as the reopening of the world starts to happen and it can be done so in a safe way, it doesn't relieve the financial burden of the local governments and this federal government to be able to help fill that gap of the of the restriction of commerce that's currently imposed upon these these businesses. And, um, you know, until until uh, that's met, uh, I, we're going to continue to see independent venues and promoters uh, suffer, uh, whether they're open or whether they're closed. Right. Yeah. And it's, and actually it's funny that, um, kind of what prompted me thinking about, um, having this conversation with you was I happened to see a, a similar, you know, distanced interview or uh, panel discussion that you were part of with some folks from the UK. I think somebody from Switzerland, Spain, and Germany, Germany were yeah. there. And <laughs> it was funny when, when the person from Germany explained the basically government help that the independent live music network yeah. in Germany was about to get, or I guess had started getting the rest of you, UK, US, yeah. <laughs> Switzerland, Spain, all went, we're going to move to Germany. Well, uh, I mean, so you, the, you put $150 million any, dollars on the table, you yeah. start thinking about moving, right? But is there you know, any it, it, that what the German, and I, and I did a tiny bit of research, and I, and I saw that uh, Germany and France, I think, are in sort of a, uh, a team now of sure. providing funding for, to keep some of the independent venues and the independent live music um, circuit afloat. Is, do you think there's any way that what they're doing and and specifically germany because that was that seemed like an amazing amount of money for the german government to say we need you to stay stay alive here yeah you, i mean do you really do, i know you guys have hired a legit lobbying firm yeah which is which is amazing and that's the way it has to be done in the united states um do do you think uh, Congress, which I guess has the final say, um, get it. I would, I would certainly hope so. But um, you know, almost every other country in the world has a head start, 
in that they prioritize um, uh, the arts sector differently yeah. than how the Americans do. And there's, you know, there's usually funding programs or grant programs or subsidies that um, that would help contemporary artists in a way that uh, that we don't necessarily do. And and I'm talking about everything from education to um, business development funding. And a lot of the programs that we at Marauder run are in turn funded by these foreign government uh, export offices that are helping their own um, small businesses, which are musicians or record labels or, or conferences or festivals, do business in other parts of the world. So yeah. um, it's when, music. There, I mean, it's, it's fine art. It's yeah. Um, but when, but so when so when the industry has a need, that pipeline is already there. We as Americans have not had that pipeline. So the existence of Neva and the creation of Neva uh, to be able to unite all the independent venues and promoters and say, look, here's thousands of different businesses that are all being represented by the same voice that we're all singularly asking for the same thing. I think we're in a better position now than we've ever been historically. Yeah. To be able to um, help reach those um, those change makers, if you will, and uh, we do have support. You know, we have support in the House and the Senate. Uh, we yeah, have. I was going to say there there has already been like a bipartisan bill presented, significant, right? Significant significant support, bipartisan support. But you know, that's that we're talking about CARES four, which isn't necessarily you know until uh, the end of July or something like that. So uh, we need support now, and and we need it we need it quickly. Jeff, I, I can't tell you how, how grateful I am that you took the time to, to, to talk with me. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I, I think what you guys what you guys do is just so fantastic. It's it's really um, nice to have the um, the support of, of, of you guys and, and the station and, and everyone involved because uh, you're just you're just it's people like you that make it possible for others to understand what's what's happening right now. Well, that, and that's that was part of what. I mean, just because of, you know, some of the things I follow online or whatever, I found out about that that conference panel thing yeah. we were on a couple of weeks ago. So I was I happened to be around and I was like, oh, OK, I'll I'll watch. And it was eye opening. It was enlightening. It was <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll say a little frightening every time you spoke because it's like really you know, upsetting because it's the, really the upsetting so far behind. In, in dealing with arts and culture, yeah. um, you know, almost every other industry has a safety net built in, but, you know, the, the independent art, culture, live music, that kind of stuff didn't. Um, and I think what you said is, is true, that instead of having 2,500 independent venues trying to raise their hand and make calls and, and make change, it is better to collect them all and have... Yeah have you know one have a point at the end of it um that deals with the you know hiring a lobbying firm and coming up with the language and 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 even coming up with the numbers look it's stressful and um and i i apologize because i i have to run but it's it's stressful and you know, I'd love to be able to, to to reconnect with you in three months or six months and look <laughs> at all the celebrating that we're doing and look at all the, the rooms that we were able to protect. And but the reality is, is right now we're seeing rooms close on a daily basis. Yeah. And that's it's really upsetting. And, you know, we're we're we're, we're doing what we can to try to to minimize that. And uh, and, and I'm really hopeful that the pieces are going to come together. Cool. Thank you for taking. Whoops. Thank you for taking the time, Moose. I appreciate it. Um, SaveOurStages.com is the place to to visit, and you'll find links to the Facebook and the Instagram and all that other stuff there. Oh, and most importantly, there is a an already written letter that all you have to do is put in your name and your zip code, uh, and somehow you guys figured out by zip code who's ever who everyone's representative is. Again, I'm going to take full credit for that. It's completely and only. No, it's it's. You know, look, it, it's we have we've generated over half a million letters to Congress, and we need more. So please go to saveourstages.com, and uh, you know, there's there's information on there about what we're fighting for and why we're fighting for it, and um, the it, it makes it uh, um, easy to be able to to take uh, to take action. Absolutely. Thank you, Moose. I will talk to you soon. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Anytime.
Hopefully right. on a better note in a couple so. months. <laughs> Thanks, man. See you later.